Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Anne Blythe in Isabel Dick's Wild Orchard on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present a story by Isabel Dick called Wild Orchard. You know, on our Playhouse, we're rather partial to stories of pioneer life because they do portray so vividly the problems and solutions that made our country great. But now for a change, we cross the Pacific and tell a story which shows how the same pioneering spirit lived and thrived in the lands down under. Tasmania, where our Wild Orchard was, and Australia, the great neighboring continent, were built like our own, out of the rich and rough life of brave men and women, and their histories are the sum total of countless personal adventures. To star in such an adventure tonight, we have chosen most appropriately one of Hollywood's most delightful actresses, young and enchanting Anne Blythe. And now, here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you want to remember your friends, there's one way to be sure the card you send receives an extra welcome. Look for that identifying hallmark on the back when you select it. For words to express your feelings and designs to express your good taste, that hallmark on the back is your guide. Like the sterling on silver, it's a mark of distinction that all quickly recognize. And it tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. And now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Isabel Dick's Wild Orchard, starring Anne Blythe. a long way from the friendly orchards of Harriet's childhood to the wild, untamed orchards on the island of Tasmania off the coast of Australia. A long way from the cannon's lovely young daughter to the plowman from down under. Yet youth could cross those miles and make them seem as nothing. I met Jan when I was 17. I had been locked in my room as a punishment for some prank I cannot even remember. And since every locked door was a challenge to me in those days, I had escaped through a window and gone running across the fields to the road to the village. It was a road I had known all my life. It became a road I had never walked before. It led uphill and downhill beside meadow and river from childhood to womanhood. For at the end of it, I found Jan. He was guiding a plow across the furrows and he stopped and waved when he saw me. Hello there. He was a stranger, but I ran down the hill toward him ran headlong into the adventure of my life. <laughs> Watch out, you'll fall right on your face. Uh, not today. I won't fall down today. <laughs> How do you know? Oh, because this is my day. It belongs to me. How do you figure that? Oh, it's mine because I stole it. Oh, you're a queer one. How can you steal a day? Oh, well, I'm locked up in my room right now as far as father's concerned. That's why I've stolen the day. So you're a thief, are you? You must be the daughter of the village reprobate. I am the daughter of the canon. Weren't you in the cathedral on Sunday to hear my father's sermon? Oh, 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 the daughter of the canon. What's your name? Harry. Harry? That's no name for a girl. Oh, well, my name's really Harriet, but that's no name for me. No, I guess it isn't. That's no name for a girl who runs about stealing days while her father's back is turned. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? Jan Halifax. Oh, yes, of course. I've heard about you. You're the man from Australia who's working for the Dillardays. That's right. Your father has a tannery in Australia. You have five sisters. And you're working as a hired hand for the Dillardays so you can learn about growing hops. And then you're going home and grow them. How did you and... know all that? News travels fast here. <laughs> oh, I should say it does. Well, I must say you know far more about me than I know about you. Well, there's not much to know about me. Nothing much has ever happened to me. 
until today. I did not run home. I walked home, slowly, reflectively, lost in dreams that had no beginning and no ending. A man had smiled, and I was a child no longer. And the bright, glad road I had taken on a day I had stolen had led into enchantment. A few days later, I stole an evening and went to the village fair. I saw Jan standing by the carousel. Well, if it isn't the canon's daughter, are you on another stolen outing? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I am. You're supposed to be locked in your room again? <laughs> I'm afraid I am. Why? <laughs> well, I'm supposed to be locked up tonight because I didn't stay locked up the other day. Here. Take my arm. Let's walk down the road a bit of this episode. will be all over the village by morning. <laughs> oh, it'll be all over the village anyhow, and I may be locked up for a week. But it'll be worth it. To escape is worth almost any penalty, is it? To escape? And to see you. How am I to take that? Are you flirting with me? Teasing me? Leading me on? Perhaps. You see, I've only grown up very recently. I suppose I'm still experimenting. Don't experiment on me. Just say what you really mean. Well, I don't know quite what to talk to you about. You come from such a long way off. What is it like in your country? Well, it's rough and untamed. We have to depend on convict labor for a good deal of our work. But there's something growing, beginning, a new country taking shape and form under our hands. And you will be part of it. I am part of it. I have a piece of land on the island of Tasmania, just off the coast. There's only a shack on it now, but I'm going back and clear the land and cultivate. I'm going to build a fine, big house. And will you live in that house alone? I hope not, Harry. I hope not. Harriet, kindly sit in that chair in front of the desk. Yes, Father. Harriet, on Saturday night when I ordered you to remain in your room, did you run away and go to the village fair? Yes, Father. Harriet, what am I going to do with you? You're absolutely incorrigible. Yes, Father. Now, Harriet, a young man has been here. His name is Jan Halifax. Do you know him? Uh, yes, Father. This young man tells me that he's from Australia. His father has died. He must leave for home almost immediately. Yes, Father. This young man is quite highly spoken of by the Dillardays and other mutual friends. He seems to come of good family. He makes a good impression. Yes, Father? Perhaps if I were a young girl, I might have been tempted to visit the fair myself under the circumstances. <clears throat> this young man, Jan Halifax, has asked my permission to marry you. Would this make you happy, Harriet? Oh, yes, Father. Oh, yes, Father. <laughs> I, Jan, take thee, Harriet, to my wedded wife, to love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. The words were old, beloved words, measured out for us in the stately voice of my father. I now pronounce you man and wife. Those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Beyond my father's voice, a ship waited. A new country, a new life. Jan kissed me and led me from the church into the future. We were months at sea. During the voyage, Jan told me of his island. Tasmania's wild country, Harry. As I warned you, almost all the laborers are convicts from England. And apart from the ones under control are large bands of convicts that have escaped. They roam the countryside at will, pilfering, plundering sometimes even murdering. Bushwhackers, they're called. I've been wondering now if it's safe to take you there. Oh, you told me there were other women there. Yes, in the settlement. But my land is inland. It's uncultivated and in some ways unprotected. I'm not afraid, Jan. You want me to be with you, don't you? Harry, I want you more than anything in the world. I... I can't tell you how I feel about it. My land. Mine. Oh, I can't wait to see it. Oh, tell me again, what's the house like? It's just one room now, one big room built around a stone fireplace. But we'll add to it. Before we're finished, we'll have a mansion. 
A mansion set in the heart of the wild orchard. You'll see our land before the month is over. And you'll see the house. Oh, Harry, even though it's only one room now, I know you'll like it. We landed in Australia. We spent a few days in the house Jan's father left on the mainland, getting ready to start into the wilderness. While Jan saw to his father's estate, I explored the town. The Halifax tannery was one of the main industries, and the income we would receive from that would help finances until Jan was able to get the land producing. He put an overseer in charge of the tannery, and then he bought a wagon and team, and we loaded it with furniture and supplies. And we were at last on our way. We crossed the bluest water I had ever seen to the island of Tasmania. We made our way along a river beside giant mimosa trees and gnarled wild apple orchards. We made our way deeper and deeper into the jungle growth called the bush. And finally, we turned into an old gate with the name Halifax cut into it. And Jan stood up in the wagon. I never realized how loud the river was before. That's going to be almost in your front yard, Harry. Oh, it sounds like a giant raging at the land. <laughs> You'll see the house in a moment, just as soon as we get around the bend. I don't think I've ever been so excited in my life. Well, now then, the house should be in sight. Whoa, whoa there. Oh. Where is the house, Jan? Well, it should be right over there. That's hard to see looking into the sun like this. Here, jump down, Harry. We'll have a look. Oh. That looks like a chimney over there, Jan. It is a chimney. Harry, look, these charred logs. The house has been burned. Burned? Who would burn it? Savages or, or bush rangers from out there in the bush. You can't stay here now. I have to take you back to the mainland. What are you going to do? I'm going to get some laborers and start a new house. Then I'm staying here with you. I can't keep you here, Harry. It might be dangerous. I'll just put up a tent for myself. If you're going to stay, Jan, I'm going to stay with you. We'll build our new home together. I'm sorry I got you into all this. To bring your way out here and find no oh, house for you. don't be sorry, Jan. I'm not. We'll have a new house, a house that we'll both be a part of. Because we built it together. I guess I picked the right girl to bring out here. I'm going to love it here. It's beautiful country, isn't it, Harry? It is beautiful, Jan. House or no house, I feel as though I've really found a home in this wild orchard. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Wild Orchard, starring Anne Blythe. Have you looked out at the trees lately? It's along about this time of year that one day we look and the leaves we've become accustomed to seeing green have suddenly taken on new colors, or may not even be there at all. In short, it's October. And quickly, before we even realize it, it'll be Christmas. Now, you may be one of those who enjoys the last-minute rush of selecting gifts... But there's one gift I think you'll enjoy even more if you select it early and with care. That's the Christmas card you want imprinted with your name. For your card is a gift, you know. It represents your thoughtfulness and good taste to all the friends you want to remember at Christmas. That's why I think you'll want to see the Hallmark album containing the beautiful new 1951 Hallmark personalized Christmas cards. You'll find this Hallmark album at fine stores across the country. And right now, you can make your selection leisurely and with care, selecting the very card you'd like to have imprinted with your name. You'll find there are Hallmark Christmas cards to meet every taste and every budget. And each one is designed with the good taste you've come to expect from any card bearing that familiar Hallmark on the back. And that's a symbol of quality all instantly recognize and realize you cared enough to send the very best. Now, back to James Hilton in the second act of Wild Orchard, starring Anne Blythe. So, Harry.
Harriet and Jan started to build their home in the heart of a wild orchard. Jan hired the only labor available, prison labor. Foundations were dug and the building begun. And during those first months in the wilderness, Harriet realized she was going to have a child. I met Jan when I was 17, as I ran down a road I had known all my life. A road that suddenly became one I had never walked before. I followed it out of the land of my own people into a strange foreign land on the other side of the world. I found a home on that road beside a wilderness river. Don't walk in, Harry. It's the custom to carry the bride over the threshold, you know. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> a bride? Why, we've been married over a year now. You're a bride until you settle down as a wife <laughs> in your new home. Oh. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> oh, funny. I've watched it built every foot of the way, and yet I feel as though I'm seeing it for the first time. Oh, Jan, I'll sit by that fireplace and rock my baby's cradle. I'll stand by this window and wave to you as you go down to the fields in the morning. I'll stand in that doorway and wait for you in the evening. And you'll be building a country. And I'll be building a home. You'll be helping build the country, too. They go hand in hand. And by the time our son grows to manhood, the land will be tamed, laid out in civilized acres, and the house will be mellowed and seen part of the land. Oh, oh, Jan. Oh, darling, darling, what's the matter? I, I feel a little dizzy. Oh. You'd better hitch up the wagon. I've got to get to town. The doctor. Harry, sit down. Let me get you some no. water. No, no, hitch up the wagons, Jan. Hurry. Oh, hurry. <laughs> No sound quite so beautiful before. No sound so full of promise, so full of hope. A skillful slap by the doctor and my son was thrust into the world with a lusty cry of protest. I held him in my arms and thought of England. I thought of fine old houses and cultured gardens. I thought of trees, bent a little with years of fruitful giving, crouched just right for a child to... I thought of all the wonderful things a boy might see and do in England. And then I thought of Tasmania. I thought of my son growing up in the bush country. There was much he would miss. But he would see for himself the effort, the labor, the strength, the sacrifice that must go into a home. Things would not come easily for him. All that came would have to be earned. He might gain more than he lost by being born in the wilderness. So I held him against my heart and dreamed and thought and prayed. When I went home, our first crops were beginning to thrust green heads through the rich black soil. I looked at them with pride and with a sense of achievement. I was completely unprepared for what Jan had to say to me. Harry, would you like to live on the mainland? Live on the mainland? You remember that I put a man in charge of my father's business? The tannery, yes. He's walked off with all the money in the till, left the men unpaid, left the business in heaven knows what condition. I, I'll have to go over and straighten things out. Harry, you know my father left a fine house. I... I thought perhaps you might like to live there. I could take charge of the tannery What and... about this house that is hardly finished? What about the crops that are starting to grow? What about all that we were going to do here? It would be a different life. But perhaps it would be a happier, more secure life for you and the baby. Yes. It would be that. There would be more comforts in a house in town. It would be a gayer life. We would be closer to people. Oh, but Jan... We would just be picking up the threads of your father's life. We've started a life of our own out here. We have our crops, our home, our family. This land, it's part of you. It's, it's your life. Jan, I want you to sell the tannery. Sell it? Yes, sell it so this discussion can never come up again. This is where you belong. It's where I belong. And it's where our son belongs. If I sell the tannery, it'll be a loss, and we won't have the income we've had from that behind us. We'll manage. Other people have managed, and we can do it. 
It's what you want, isn't it, Jan? Isn't this where you want to live? It is where I want to live, Harry. Then we'll stay, Jan. We'll stay. Jan left the next day for the mainland. I remained alone in the house with the baby. Jan wanted one of the hired hands to stay in the house, but I was not afraid. It did not even occur to me to be frightened until I entered the house one night about dusk and found a strange man in my living room. Then and only then did I think of the bands of roving convicts, the bush rangers. The man that sat at ease in my living room had the manners of an English gentleman. He rose as I entered. There was nothing frightening about him until you looked in his eyes. Good evening, ma'am. Is Mr. Halifax at home? No, he isn't. It occurred to me that he might not be. And then it also occurred to me that if he wasn't, this charming lady might offer me a cup of tea. It will be my pleasure. The kettle is on. It will soon be hot. I don't think it was wise of Mr. Halifax to leave you alone and unprotected. He didn't think it was wise either, but I persuaded him that I would be quite all right. Tell me, whatever made a woman like you come to a country like this? What brought you here? I'm not here by choice. You must have chosen whatever it was that brought you here. Perhaps the same basic aims led us both here. Longing for adventure, the excitement of unknown danger. Are you excited now, Mrs. Halifax? No. The danger is not unknown. I'm quite aware of it. Why don't you scream, then? Why don't you run for help? Aren't you afraid of me? Let me prepare your tea. I have 30 men out there. You're alone, quite alone. We plan to rifle the house, and if you made trouble, silence you. Do you take milk with your tea? <laughs> I could almost believe I was in an English drawing room again, being soundly wrapped on the knuckles by a disapproving aunt. Rifle the house, if you will. I have learned in the wilderness that one can live without any possessions. Burn the house, if you like. I've also learned that all houses can be built again. Silence me. Someone else will come here to live in my place. Nothing ends. Life is a continuing pattern. One person puts something down, another picks it up. No. No, I'm not afraid of you. I'm sorry for you. Sorry for me? Yes. Sorry that you must live as you do. Sorry that you must steal when others can earn. Have you any idea who I am? Yes. You are a man without a home, without a name, without a family. I could not possibly fear you. My pity is too great. I came back early to surprise you, Harriet. Why? Didn't realize you had a guest. Well, this gentleman lost his way and stopped by to ask some directions, Jan. Can I help you, sir? Uh, thank you, no. Your wife has already obliged. Good day, Mrs. Halifax. You're quite right. I had lost my way. I may not find my way, although your directions were quite good. But I shall remember you on my journey. Good day. He didn't give his name. I didn't ask for it. I was worried about you. The bush rangers are out again. Oh, I've been quite all right, darling. Except I missed you. Harry... I sold the tannery. You sold the tannery? Oh, Jan, that's wonderful news. Wonderful news. Did you miss me? Oh, I missed you very much. Oh, you know my legs are buckling under me. I think I'm a little tired. All the excitement of... That man upset you. What did he say to you? Oh, no. No, the man didn't upset me. The man made me realize how very fortunate you and I are. Oh, we may not have much money. We may not have many worldly possessions... But we have each other. We have a home, our crops. And more than anything else, we have the future, Jan. We have a future to plan and dream and create. We have found a world here in the heart of a wild orchard. And 
Blythe and James Hilton will return in a moment. A few minutes ago, I mentioned that your Christmas card is really a Christmas gift from you to many different people. As such, you have several things to consider when making your choice. Does this card represent my feelings about Christmas? Does it reflect my taste in color and design? Will it be welcomed by my friends and proudly displayed by them all during the holidays? You can be sure of the answer to these questions if you ask to see the Hallmark Christmas Card album when you go in to select the card you want imprinted with your name. For in the large and beautiful Hallmark album, you're sure to find the very card that expresses your sentiments exactly. Whether you want a gay, light-hearted, personal approach or a more formal but still warm and friendly greeting. When you stop to think that your Christmas card often is your only contact with friends who live far away or others you don't see frequently, Surely you'll want your card to have that hallmark on the back, which tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. You gave us a fine performance, Anne Blythe. Thank you. It's always so nice to be on the Hallmark Playhouse with you, Mr. Hilton. I like the stories you select. And, of course, Hallmark Cards and I are old friends. When they appear in my mailbox, I always feel as if I had just received a very friendly smile. Well, if cards could smile, I'm sure they'd smile at you, Anne. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. You know, I was interested in reading the excellent reviews of the new television show, Hallmark Cards Presents Sarah Churchill. And I'm looking forward to seeing it here in California October 21st, a week from this Sunday evening. She's so charming. Yes, isn't she? Sarah, you know, was on the Hallmark Playhouse with us last spring, and we all enjoyed her visit. I hope to have her with us again later in the season, so those cities that don't receive her new television show can hear her in one of our Hallmark Playhouse stories. Oh, that will be grand. What are you planning for next week on the Hallmark Playhouse, Mr. Hilton? Next weekend, we shall present our dramatization of a novel by the inimitable George Bernard Shaw. It's a gay love story about a prize fighter and a beautiful society girl, Cashel Byron's profession. And as our star, we shall have Joseph Cotton. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our producer-director is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our script tonight was adapted by Gene Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Anne Blythe can now be seen in The Golden Horde, Universal International Technicolor production, co-starring David Farrar. The role of Jan tonight was played by Paul Duboff. The canon was Theodore Osborne and the Bush Ranger, Ted DeCorsia. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at this same time, when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Joseph Cotton in George Bernard Shaw's Cashel Byron's Profession. And the week following, Catherine Drinker Bowens, John Adams on the American Revolution, starring Van Heflin. And the week after that, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's Evangeline on the Hallmark Playhouse. Transcribed tonight from Hollywood, this is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri. Give it proudly. Wear it proudly. For a lifetime of greater pleasure and pride in your diamond, choose with confidence a Hellsberg Certified Perfect Diamond. Guaranteed flawless, of fine color, and full 58 facet cut for greater sparkling brilliance. Give it proudly. Wear it proudly. Only Hellsberg sells certified perfect diamonds.